Are you ready? Yeah, no, hey, hello, Kaika. In the meantime, I'll introduce yourself. Welcome everyone to another evening uh, of our COVID and society course, um, and in which we partner with CUM Generale to make it available for a wider audience. Um, tonight we're joined by Dr. Jamila Shirelli. She is a, a, a doctor in global health and tropical medicine a specialty program in the Netherlands. Um, and currently joining us um, from, uh, from Lesbos, where she works as a medical coordinator uh, for the um, Boat Refugee Foundation. Um, we've asked her to join us because um, within our own European borders, um, there, there are vulnerable groups, but there are also groups who are particularly vulnerable. And the refugees that are in the Greek islands are, um, are an example of this. Um, so what we ask her to do is to share the experiences there, um, the preparation for COVID and society, oh, the uh, coronavirus outbreak, um, but also share a little bit more about the general situation. Um, for everyone, I, I do, so there are some technical challenges with the PowerPoint, that's why we cannot make it full screen. Um, so bear with us, uh, but I'm sure we can all see it uh, well enough. Um, Jamila, really nice that you're here and the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Joyce. Um, good evening, everybody, and welcome. Th sorry for the technical difficulties. It's a shame, actually, that my PowerPoint is not really working with me because most of my presentation is made up of pictures. Um, but I hope um, the story alongside with it will do the pictures justice. Um, and yeah, really great um, to be able to get this opportunity to speak about a place that is very close to my heart. Um, and I've, um, like Joyce said, this is very much going to be um, a focus on some of the most vulnerable people with regards to this outbreak and with a special focus on Moria, which is one of your, which is Europe's actually biggest refugee camp. Um, I hope you're all doing well. I hope you're all safe and healthy and that this, you will find this a very beneficial lecture. All right, please do let me know if you're not able to see the slides properly. First of all, a short introduction about myself. Um, like Joy said, I'm a Dutch uh, doctor of global health and tropical medicine, and this is a postgraduate training program, which is very unique. Um, in Dutch, we call it the Tropa Arts, for the ones of you speaking Dutch. And it's a three-year postgraduate training in which we get trained in surgery, gynecology, obstetrics, pediatrics, and also public health. And it very much trains us to work abroad in low resource settings. Um, my, I have a special interest in refugee and migrant health, and that very much originated actually from my youth, which I spent in Tanzania. And as some of you may know, Tanzania has been a hotspot for receiving refugees from neighboring countries, such as Rwanda, Burundi, and also Uganda. And um, after finishing um, high school, I spent some time in Jordan, where I did some research in um, refugee camps as well, mainly Palestinian and Iraqi refugees, and then continued on to study medicine in the Netherlands. And for my master thesis, I um, uh, researched um, undocumented migrants in the Netherlands. And um, subsequently, I went to Venice um, to do an internship with the WHO, also fo focusing on migration policy. Um, after that, I um, finished, completed my training in global health and tropical medicine, and I have worked with Doctors Without Borders in Nigeria, with Critical Care International in Mali, and recently also with SMRU on the border of Thailand and Burma, where we were working with Burmese refugees. And at the moment, I'm in on Lesbos, working for the Boat Refugee Foundation. And this is a Dutch NGO, which has been actually on Lesbos since 2015, providing initially only medical care, but now um, in recent years, also psychosocial care to the refugees in Moria. And I've been here now for, I think I'm just hitting two months. Um, so this is very much going to be, I'd like to take you in my journey of the past two months. 
Um, so that was me. Um, I'd also like to know who I'm uh, speaking to as I can only see my screen, which is a very awkward uh, situation for myself. So actually my first question goes to you, Joyce. How many participants do we have? At the moment, close to 60 people are watching uh, your lecture. And for the second question, I would like to ask everyone to actually type it into the chat and I will speak it or tell you while they do so. From which country are you attending this lecture from? The Netherlands. Um, so this part is part of a course uh, on um, for the Dutch medical students uh, of Utrecht University. So the majority is from mm -hmm. the Netherlands, but I also see Russia, Malaysia, Qatar, um and Qatar listed now nice yeah. nice welcome everybody and as I've understood most of you are medical students do we have any medical professionals with us as well has anybody um had a career as a medical professional or are you still all in a um studying phase I know there is one historian who is joining us. I, I recognize Frank Huismann's name. Oh, nice. Welcome. Uh, I see Peter Hulshoff uh, um, answers your question. He's a radiation therapist and a student of healthcare management. Okay. So some definitely at least two professionals with us at Wales, but it, it helps me just to cater to the audience and see um, what, um, what is interesting and what isn't interesting to tell you. Um, and then I think that my last four questions are actually the most important. Have any of you ever been in a refugee camp? I see you... three, two, one person said yes. So mm -hmm. four, many people indicate no. Mm -hmm. So based on the answer so far, I think we can safely say it's the vast minority. Um, yeah. One person says live there. Oh, yeah, yeah. So that's actually one of my questions as well. Um, because I think it's very important for us to realize that um, it, this is a subject that comes very close to home. Um, and as is shown from the results right now, that actually one of the participants has been is or has been a refugee, him or herself. Um, so I can um, so it's it's a subject which is it's not a far from our bed bed show. And the first the per people who have been in refugee camps have you been in Moria? Um, Jonathan says no. Mm -hmm. Miro, as uh, Miro um, hasn't answered yet, may answer okay. later in the chat. Right. Oh, he also says no. Okay, so this is a new story, I think, for all of you with regards to Moria. Some of you have been in refugee camps before, and one of you has actually lived in a refugee camp um, yourself. Um, and. Uh, my last question is whether any of you are from a family of migrants or have um, family who have lived in refugee camps. And you can indicate so in the chat. Yeah, you can just all say yes or no. Samira, uh, Samira says all of us were refugees from Afghanistan. Um, Salva indicates a family of migrants, yes. Uh, yeah. Jonathan um, also says family of migrants, yes, but no one who has lived in a camp. Ilya's family of ma uh, migrants, um, nor uh, also my family did. Yeah, yeah. Um, because what I, I think, thank you for these answers and for your honesty as well. I think uh, it was one of the conversations, for instance, that I had with some of our colleagues recently, when whenever we get new volunteers coming to Moria, we show them around the camp, um, not so much as, um, as a sightseeing tour, of course, but very much to show people um, where our patients are coming from and what the conditions are like. And also, of course, to get to know the emergency exits. And we looked at the children walking around and playing around in the camp and I realized that these are probably going to be the children that my friends will grow up with 
later. These are going to be our colleagues in the future. These are going to be, um, you know, our brothers and sisters who hopefully will make their way to Europe soon and who will be part and parcel of society. And I think that's something that is very um, clear now in your answers and something to keep in mind while I take you through this journey of Moria. Um, all right, so the learning objectives that I formulated for tonight are a couple. Um, like, like what Joyce explained, I'd really like to explore this pandemic from within a refugee camp, just to highlight the different, um, different sides to the pandemic. And I'd like to say as well, this is my disclaimer immediately, that um, this field of study, like I said, I'm very passionate about it. I've been in Moria before. I'm now here as a, as a medical coordinator. It's a cause that I believe strongly in. Um, and thus, um, I'm, I'm really taking you on this, this medical journey in Moria, which doesn't go to say that um, the other refugee camps around the world don't have similar situations, but it's very much a case study and a field experience summary. And um, this is a journey that I'd like to take you on. Um, the first, um, part I would like to highlight the challenges that we have in refugee camps and particularly in Moria when dealing with the with the COVID, with COVID. Um, explain a couple of the solutions that we have come up with and then once again come back to the challenges um, right so the first thing I would like to do is to, to give you an impression of Moria and I would like to do that by showing you a short, um, a short uh, part of a BBC documentary which was done here recently. Um, I'm going to try to get that. Um, can you all see my screen? Can you all see this? We see your PowerPoint screen. Yeah. Oh, you don't? Okay. Let me just, okay. Then let me show you. I'm just going to get the. Video. Okay, here. All right. In the meantime, Jimena, I did receive the version of the PowerPoint you just sent me. So if you want, I can also take over and make it full screen. Um, yeah, that's possible. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I think there might be some slides missing in there, but I think if you agree with me, that's probably a better version for everybody to see. Is that right? Or is this doable, what I'm it doing? It's doable, at so it's really up to you. Okay, then I'll just continue with my own, uh, with yeah. my own slide. I just need to get to the Zoom the zoom link oh. okay i also have the video ready for you oh you do perfect yeah. so all right screen and at least show the video yes please yes please so it's from um so do you have the timing correct as yes. well i right. see from this time stamp onwards. You should be able to see my screen now. Yeah, just a couple. If you start at 8.03, that would be perfect. 8.03, and just say stop when I need to stop. Yeah. Yeah. Moria, a refugee and migrant reception center on the island of Lesbos. Built to house up to 3,000 people. Around 20,000 are now crammed in here. 3,000 arrived this year. Two students with an organization called Refocus Media Labs also sent me reports. My name is Milat. I'm from Afghanistan. People here are frightened. Coronavirus is treat for refugees. Hi, I'm Masoud. I live in Moria. I want to show you the situation in Moria. We are in danger for coronavirus. This is Dr. Zlain, who a person are very close together. 
and some people has a one meter distance, some people doesn't have any distance. There are no confirmed cases of coronavirus, but people with coughs and fever are worried. How many hours are you here? How many hours? Two hours? What's your problem? We have a lot of water. Several NGOs have doctors here, but say more are needed and they are called for the camp to be closed. It's heartbreaking, Riza. It's, it's difficult. It's heartbreaking. I fear the worst if there would be an outbreak of corona in Moria. Moria is the biggest refugee camp in Europe, which means that it is a European responsibility. I cannot ask people to stay home when there's no home. When in a tent or they're less than three square meter, there are six to seven people. I cannot ask people to wash their hands when there is one water point for 1,300 people. And I cannot ask people to isolate themselves or call a doctor when there is no doctor. The EU says it's provided two and a half billion euros since 2015 and has made 700 million more available since March to help Greece improve conditions and medical care. And that 1,000 vulnerable people were relocated last month with plans to move more. Those yep. All right. Thank yeah, you. We'll stop our share so you can take over again. Yeah. Great. All right. Can you see my screen again? We can. Um, so thank you for. Um, viewing that video. I think, I hope it gives an impression of what the situation here is, is like. Um, and just to go into a couple of details, this is a bird's eye view of Moria. Moria was initially, the red square that you can see is actually the initial site of the camp. It was built for 3,000 people. It was previously an army base, which is now being changed into a refugee camp. Um, but there are now as many as 20,000 people living in less than one kilometer square space, of which about 8,000 inside ISO boxes, inside the red um, area, and about 18,000 outside in makeshift tents. And in each these, of these ISO boxes and these tents, there's often about 10 people living in a living space. And I think that very much highlights the first problem we have when it comes to, to COVID. Um, one of the pillars and cornerstones of COVID prevention is social distancing, as you all know. Um, but as you can also imagine, social distancing is very much an illusion in Moria. You can see in this picture, as well as the following picture, that social distancing within houses is very much an impossibility. As well as that, there is um, a lack of, the, the, the camp is in general just overcrowded. So what you see here is people are constantly waiting. So this is the line uh, lining up for the um, reception area, for instance, where social distancing is not possible either. This is the line which, is, which we find in front of our clinic every single morning. And this is the food line. So this is where people stand three times a day to collect their food. So um, another cornerstone of COVID um, prevention is hygiene and sanitation. We are told over and over again that we need to wash our hands. Um, there are only 333 toilets in Moria, of which a couple of them are not usable, and it comes down to, to about 70 people using every single toilet, um, and 80 people using a shower, and there are areas in camp where there's only one tap for 1,300 people. So imagine trying to counsel patients 
to um, proper hygiene matters and washing their hands before and after food, even if they would be able to get to a tap, they would have to stand in line for a very long time to get to. I've, I mean, I've heard from colleagues that they have to sometimes stand in line for a good two hours just to go to the toilet or to take a shower. Um, another aspect of hygiene and sanitation, there is rubbish everywhere. Um, there is often open sewage. And of course, you can imagine that these are ideal situations for any infectious disease outbreaks. And this is the infamous um, plastic river, which surrounds, um, which is to one side of the camp. Then we come to healthcare. Um, currently, we are running a healthcare clinic as uh, the Both Refugee Foundation used to do emergency shifts. Um, recently, because of violence on the island and also because of the COVID uh, threat, we've had to suspend our activities, which means that we're not able to offer emergency care in the evenings anymore. And we've col we're collaborating with two other medical NGOs and offering day shifts, which means that from 8.30 to about um, 4 in the afternoon, we see as many as 200 patients. Um, we're slowly getting more and more volunteers who are coming to the island, but there were times where we would have to see these patients with a very small team um, of um, just a limited number of doctors and nurses. And this has been partly because of the lockdown measures, but also because there have been fascist attacks towards NGO workers, which meant that a lot of NGO workers had to um, evacuate the island. Um, as you know, and this is the case in the rest of the world as well, a lot of other non-urgent medical care has been suspended during the time of COVID. So it means that our um, referral options are very limited. Um, we cannot refer for um, non-urgent mental health problems, for instance, for physiotherapy, for dentistry, uh, resulting in a net effect of the level of care that we're able to offer being a lot lower than it already was and it's not suboptimal um, optimal anyway. Um, the, our limited referral capacities um, towards the hospital as well um, and like I said um, because a lot of our activities have been suspended it means that perhaps on the Monday you might see someone who had a stroke on the Friday and um, which is of course um, completely unnecessary. There's a hospital, the main referral hospital in Mytilini. Mytilini is the capital of um, Lesbos. Um, there is an ICU with a capacity of about five beds, which could potentially be expanded to 25 beds. Then the patient characteristics. Um, what you um, notice very much in our setting is that there is the classic double burden of disease. So patients, due to the sheer um, precarious living conditions, a lot of infectious diseases are thriving. So there are diarrheal diseases, there is TB, there are scabies, um, but you also have the non-communicable diseases. And there are, for example, 300 uh, patients in camp who have pre-existing conditions such as cardiac and respiratory conditions and also diabetes and hypertension. Um, and there are about 200 who are over the age of 60, 60 years. So the combination of these two, so that the living conditions as well as their vulnerability in general, um, makes them um, even more at risk for the effects of a, of a COVID outbreak. What's the COVID situation in Greece been like? Um, the figures of today show that actually Greece has been doing relatively well. If you compare them to the rest of Europe, there have been 2,903 cases so far and 173 deaths. Um, and on Lesbos, we actually had six cases of positive um, COVID in the beginning of mid-March. And these were travelers actually coming from, from abroad. One of these patients passed away, the others um, have recovered. And recently um, there have been four positive cases in the new arrivals. So the new arrivals were um, are now being um, come to the north of the island and that's where they're being tested and um, four of these tested positive recently. 
In Moria, fortunately, um, like what was said in the BBC documentary, we have fortunately not seen any positive cases yet. What we currently do is when we see any suspected cases that are um, severe enough to get a referral to the hospital, we send them to the, to the hospital and they get testing there. And so far, all the tests have been negative. Um, but I'd like to show you this mathematical modeling um, which um, has been uh, calculated based on a number of the conditions that are found in Moria. So the, the number of people, for instance, the population density, the fact that there are limited wash um, and sanitation facilities. And what you see is that a day, if a day zero, um, there is an infection which uh, reaches camp, then at day 14, you would get an exponential rise in cases, where at day 25, you would get as many as 9,000 people with symptoms. And you need to realize that this, these would be symptomatic patients. That would mean that at day 30, about here, you would have about 2,000 people who would be severely affected by COVID and who would require hospitalization. And uh, like I said, the ICU capacity in Mitterlini is extremely limited and would never be able to cope with as many as 2,000 patients. So, um, this is alarming, as you can imagine. It's something that we has been on our minds um, ever since, of course, the news of a, of a, of a pandemic reached us. Um, and now the big question is how to flatten the curve. And I'd very much like to hear your ideas. You can indicate it in the chat, or if you would like to uh, um, share your thoughts, um, Raise your hand and I can unmute you so you can elaborate on your ideas. I see the first. Um, Ilias, would you like to um, to comment? I can unmute you so that Jimmy also he hears what you have to say. Yeah, sure. Hi, um, Ilias. Um, I thought maybe um, you could enlarge the camps therein. Yeah. So you're, you're speaking about um, you're speaking about the population density and actually decongestion. Is that what you mean? Yeah. Yeah. Great idea. Jonathan also has an idea. Jonathan, um, would you like to um, share your thoughts? Oh, his microphone doesn't work. Um, evacuate the refugees to Europe is. Uh, is what he says. Love the answer. Thank you for that. <laughs> Sam, uh, would you like to um, also share your comment? Um, yeah, I thought maybe some extra water taps and toilets and just sanitary um, access for the yeah. people already there because before you can spread everyone across Europe, it should be well nice to have some extra uh, space to wash your hands. Yeah, really good idea as well. Thank you for that, Sam. Anna, uh, would you like to also um, share your suggestion? If your microphone works. If not, I can. Uh, so Anna suggests early isolation of suspected cases. Nice. Nice. Yeah. Girl, would you like to go next? Um, if you want to, you can ask you or you can share your comment. Yeah, you speaking to me, Joyce, or to someone else? Uh, Samiro. Oh, Samiro. Okay. Yeah. Samiro, I muted you. So if you want, you can discuss. But maybe your microphone is not working. So what he uh, wrote down was the only way is the EU taking responsibility on a political level. Great. Yeah. Yeah, so those were the answers so far. Yeah, thank you guys for those answer, I, answers. I think they're um, all very good answers um, on different levels. So um, what you actually, I mean, uh, Sam spoke really about the, the grassroots level, at which you're trying to get more wash facilities and encouraging people to wash their hands. And there's two of you, um, I think Samira as well, who are speaking about um, really a political level on a regional level that were um, there's decongestion of the camps. So yes, 
absolutely, I agree with all your options and I will take you through all the different things that we've been doing in our setting here so far. Um, and this is to illustrate that if you actually, so this is some very complicated maths, which I cannot do, but the Center for Crisis Studies and Mitigation can do. Um, and they have calculated that if you look at the blue line, for instance, this is the initial, what the initial baseline, what it would look like without interventions. And then subsequently with each and every intervention, if you add those on top of each other, what it would mean for um, an outbreak in Moria specifically. So this is specific for Moria. Um, and we'll go through all the different interventions. Um, having, um, what's very important I think to mention to you is that there are, all these interventions have been a large collaboration between um, many NGOs, both medical NGOs as well as non-medical NGOs. And this slide is definitely not exhaustive because like I said previously, a lot of the NGOs have had to suspend their activities because of violence on the island and also because of COVID. But these are the main NGOs that we have been working with, um, where the UNHCR of course um, is not an NGO and um, this is the logo of the Greek public health uh, sector. Um, so I'm definitely not taking credit for all of these interventions. Um, yeah, I think um, like what, you, what all of you mentioned as well, I think one of the most important interventions is the fact that these refugees should not be locked in a refugee camp in the first place. Um, I think the... Um, um, I mean, the, the refugee problem in Moria has been existent since 2015, and it's only now that really all eyes seem to be fixed on this refugee camp um, because of COVID. But um, um, the plight of these refugees has been existent uh, for years. Um, so definitely evacuation is something that I feel is um, in fact the only lasting solution. You cannot put 20,000 people in a space for 3,000 and then expect to curb an outbreak with just washing facilities or with just extra medical care. Um, and this is the SOS Moria campaign, which was advertised on the website, I think, of the Studium um, Generale as well, um, in which um, a couple of, um, a number of doctors have signed a petition in which we really call the EU to, um, to evacuate Moria and to um, relocate the refugees in the different member states. Another intervention which has been implemented by the government is a lockdown of camps. So Greece has been in lockdown. We're slowly opening up our borders again as of the 15th of June, initially nationally, and then as of the 1st of July internationally. But there has been a lockdown of Moria as a camp itself, um, allegedly to protect the inhabitants, which means that between seven in the morning and seven at night, there are um, um, there is very limited movement that is possible with a maximum of 100 persons who are able to leave the camp a day, only one person per family. Um, and there are police checkpoints, which are, there are actually multiple police uh, checkpoints. Um, an ATM has been installed in camp, meaning that slowly this camp of Moria is becoming a self-sufficient entity. Um, and the lockdown measures for the camp of Moria, we just heard, have been extended again until at least the 7th of June. Another intervention which one of our sister NGOs uh, started with is a decongestion of the food lines. I showed you the picture of how the food lines were initially. So there have been initiatives in which certain zones of camp, there are um, new food lines have been created where um, people can actually come in slots to collect their food. Um, and a second um, intervention is shielding. And before um, you read that slide, can any, does any, has everyone heard of the concept of shielding? Can anyone explain it to me? You can indicate in the chat. 
Also, if you haven't heard of the term shielding, because it's slightly less familiar than the traditional triad of test, tra uh, trace, isolate. Yeah. So maybe, Juna, you can explain yeah. what it is. So, yeah, so shielding is very much like Joyce said, it's something which is very specific also to refugee camps. So the concept be behind shielding is that you actually identify the most vulnerable in, your, in the refugee camp and you, um, you isolate them from the rest of camp as, so as to protect them. So you're protecting the most vulnerable by um, helping them to live separately from the general population and thereby limiting, if not completely eliminating, the contacts between the vulnerable, the high risk and the low risk people that may result in transmission and also limiting the contact between these high risk people and food and water, for instance, that might, may give them the virus. Um, and there's different ways in which this can be done. Um, I think this is quite illustrative. You probably can't read the text, but that's not necessary. There's different options. You can do that at household level where you take, for instance, a room and you isolate the vulnerable person in the room. It can be done at block or neighborhood level where in each neighborhood you take a couple of houses where the vulnerable are shielded. And it can also be done at sector level. Um, and each one of these methods has its advantages and its disadvantages. Initially in Moria, we started plans of starting um, actually an option number four, um, which is um, we identified a warehouse and together with um, MSF, so with Doctors Without Borders, we um, started looking at the possibility of, um, um, of somehow changing the setting of this warehouse so that all the vulnerable people could stay in the warehouse. Um, that plan was not, we didn't manage to execute that plan. And we've now actually gone on to option number four, which is to, um, to transfer, to actually evacuate all the vulnerable people from camp. So what our medical team has done is that we've looked at our patient records, we've identified these um, about uh, 400 people who are vulnerable, who have chronic conditions, and who would um, be most at risk uh, for developing um, life-threatening consequences of COVID. And we've given this list to the UNHCR, and the UNHCR has been trying to evacuate these people to either um, hotels on the island or to hotels on the mainland. And um, I will show you a couple of pictures. So for example, this was two weeks ago. So what you see is that a couple of our medical volunteers are handing out, um, this is a group of um, families that were um, evacuated to the mainland and they were receiving their medication and their masks for their journey. Um, so that's the concept of shielding. Then of course, um, what a couple of you mentioned as well, I mean, the basic hygiene um, uh, interventions are really important as well. So IPC, infection prevention control, what another NGO has been doing is that they've started, they've set up water points at different points of, in camp where people can frequently wash their hands and where they are taught how to properly wash their hands. Then of course, um, health promotion is always extremely important and there's various NGOs from MSF to very much um, local refugee um, groups who have started health promotion campaigns. Um, as you can see, for example, this is a poster that we've hung up in our clinic where we are teaching people how to not cough into their hands. Um, there's been a helpline which has been started by MSF with, um, um, there have been Facebook groups to really get the message out there how to prevent um, COVID and to protect oneself. Um, of course, in our own clinic, we've been concentrating on interventions as well. So just the general IPC, so it's important. I mean, this is always necessary, but even more necessary in times of outbreaks, of course. So the general hygiene in the clinic, the wearing of proper protective um, equipment. Our clinic is um, unfortunately extremely small. We're not able um, physically, um, just uh, technically to um, keep social distancing. 
um, because of the, the, the size of our clinic and the number of patients. So what we um, do is that we always wear, um, we always wear protective um, a mask and, and gloves, for instance. Um, we, the, the patients though, we do allow them, we do try to keep the one meter, the one and a half meter distance and not allow too many patients into the clinic at the same time. We've given training to our staff and our translators because this is very important. We work with both an international team of volunteer medics, but we also work with a very dedicated team of um, refugees who are there to, um, who are really the backbone of the clinic and who help us in translation. And we've trained them in um, general IPC and also in uh, PPE, as you can see in the picture. Um, and then, of course, initially we started a, a certain triage in which we did not let any patients with possible COVID symptoms into the clinic. So it's very important, and you, you probably have learned this in other lectures, that when you are dealing with a healthcare facility, it's very important to separate the a dirt, dirty from a non-dirty area. So the COVID suspects and the non-COVID suspects. <clears throat> Um, one of a very big project which has recently started, I think it's been uh, two weeks now, is our central triage, which is what you can see here. And our central triage is a place where we have um, we screen every patient that is requiring medical care. So this is very much a triage area for COVID where patients come in, if they show any symptoms of COVID, they are um, seen um, by a doctor. Um, if they do not, they are either get a short nursing consultation and receive direct primary care, or they are referred onto another health um, institute within the camp. And then they present themselves at the door of the clinic where they then don't need to be screened again. Once the doctor has seen the patient, um, the patient can either be, um, can either be um, dismissed or the patient can be um, recognized as a possible COVID suspect and will then be transferred to our isolation center, um, which I should not call isolation center, but it's called our inpatient uh, center. And that's, I think one of you mentioned this as well. It's um, the importance of case identification and management. So we screen everybody requiring healthcare. We have certain criteria that um, make them a possible COVID suspect, yes or no. And if we do consider them a COVID suspect, they are sent to an isolation, to an inpatient clinic where they, are, um, they receive testing. And up until the moment that they, um, their results come back, they stay in isolation. And this is an example of one of the rooms. And this health facility, this inpatient clinic is run by MSF and they receive, twin, they receive care there for, for 24 hours. So it's um, very important in identification, but of course also in management. So you need to be able to see whether a patient is deteriorating, yes or no, and whether a patient would need a, trans, would need, um, a referral to the hospital. Um, Oh, so these are a number of the um, interventions that we've been able to put in place so far over the past two months that um, I've been here at least. Um, but as you can imagine, there have been numerous challenges as well. And um, I'd like to hear your ideas. What do you think are the challenges? You can indicate it in the chat. with any of these. So looking at, for example, the case identification and management, what could be challenges? What could be challenges in the triage? What could be challenges in our clinic? We spoke about um, the space constraints, for instance, health promotion, IPC, shielding, shielding, and then there is the first intervention, decongestion and evacuation. Jonathan um, suggests linguistic barriers when implementing interventions. Yeah. Um, 
Ilias um, comments um, the psychosocial burden. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Solva um, uh, right separation of family and friends. Really good ideas. Yeah. 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 Jonathan, Jonathan also says budget issues. Thank you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the, the, one of the biggest headaches, yes. Uh, Nicia uh, writes, perhaps controlling the situation in panic uh, when or if the cases do start piling up. Yes, definitely. Uh, Jonathan also comments um, with decongesting the camps, also political willingness from EU countries. Yes. Very relevant. Yeah, very relevant. Leila says having enough equipment, for example, masks. Perfect, yeah. Do you want to continue? I think I'm very pleased with all your answers. <laughs> No, I'm very much impressed because I think a lot, may, a lot of what you're saying, I actually haven't mentioned, of course, are definitely challenges, but I haven't even mentioned on the following slide. So thank you for that. Um, and also it goes to show that um, all the challenges that you've actually mentioned yourself are very much, there's a couple of them, of course, which are universal, but there's many of them which are very specific to our um, particular situation. So you're speaking about language barriers, um, for instance, that's a, um, a problem which is very specific to our situation in a refugee camp where there are various um, ethnic groups speaking different languages and where a lot of the NGO workers actually do not speak the language of of their beneficiaries. Um, we spoke about funding. I think, of course, that's a, a general uh, problem. Political willingness, of course, is definitely one of the bottlenecks of um, especially the evacuation. Um, you mentioned uh, mental and psychosocial burdens. I think I'm really glad that someone mentioned that. So thank you for that. Well done for remembering it because it's something which is often, very often overlooked. Um, and like I said, a lot, of, um, a lot of our referral options at the moment are not existent anymore. So, um, and most of the inhabitants of Moria have some form of, um, uh, of psycho psychological burden already um, pre-existing um, just due to their, due to their um, to their stories and what they had to go through to get to Moria, then the circumstances in Moria are atrocious, as you have seen. So that does not help um, for mental health. And then if on top of that, you get um, rumors and ideas about um, a COVID outbreak, of course, this is can be of uh, quite a challenge. Um, and I think, I'm, I think that's, th those were the main points um, that you mentioned. Um, a couple of the other challenges, for instance, uh, this is a site which you will see often in Moria, unfortunately. So there is quite a bit of civil unrest in the camp, which is not surprising since there are 3,000 people, um, there are 20,000 people living in a space for 3,000 people. There are different ethnic groups living together. Um, people have now have movement restrictions. They're not able to get into town. They're not able to, um, to get the commodities that they want. And tensions in camp are definitely rising. There have been a couple of um, fights recently. Just last week, two people were stabbed and actually one of them uh, passed away. Um, and um, these riots in camp are definitely a challenge. Um, as well as that, a challenge for us as NGO workers, which I mentioned as well, has been that over the years, the um, atmosphere in Lesbos, unfortunately, has been um, deteriorating somewhat, where fascist groups are now um, rioting against um, not only the refugees, but also NGO workers. So on the 1st of May, for instance, this is a picture from the 1st of May where people from my organization as well were actually were attacked by fascists. And this was a reason for, for instance, half of our mission to be evacuated from the island, which consequently has as a consequence that your um, your mandates and your possibilities to work are much more limited. And the you, the size of your teams are a lot smaller as well. 
Um, I think we touched upon this as well. So just the bureaucratic processes and the legal requirements, I think this is something which is very much underestimated and is extremely difficult. Um, for example, if we look at the evacuation of the vulnerables, um, there are certain um, um, geographical restrictions that the refugees have which cannot be lifted, which means that they cannot be evacuated from the island, even though they have been recognized as vulnerable. Um, there are diagnoses as NGOs does not count as official enough, so they need to be seen by the official Greek system to actually get the, the stamp as being chronically ill. Um, resettlement procedures have been suspended and um, within the NGO world we definitely have concerns over the COVID outbreak actually being used to enforce anti-migratory -migra laws. So if you look for example at the lockdown of Moria and it becoming this self-sufficient um, camp, um, there are concerns over what the future um, of that holds. Um, I spoke about the tensions in Moria and on, on Lesbos itself. Um, please um, think back of the slide which I showed you with all the logos of the different NGOs. And those are now just the NGOs which are still left standing during this COVID outbreak. Um, it's great. We're, I think these are great times where we've all put our hands together and are working together, but that can be quite a challenge as well, um, working with um, different stakeholders. I spoke about staffing. One of you mentioned um, rumors, I think, um, of, for instance, um, when we still call the isolation center, the isolation center, um, rumors about that um, started spreading around camp. Um, very similar, if you think back, for example, of the Ebola outbreak. Um, and then um, there is also physical space. I think the, the first person who, who um, answered my question, you mentioned actually, I think it was Ilias, who you, you mentioned um, extending, extending camp, which is a great idea, definitely. But um, this, the, um, there is a lot of, there's a lot of bureaucracy which is necessary because the land um, belongs to, to either the government or it belongs to Greek people. And, it's extremely complicated and it's a very slow process. And um, even if you look at, for instance, the, the clinic space that we have and that we've been trying to um, extend for years and have not been able to do so. And one of you um, um, mentioned the, um, the resources as well. So initially it was actually very challenging for us to get proper PPE onto the island. Um, and in general, there is a global demand for resources. And um, more often than not, it is um, the, um, yeah, the rich who um, gets access to these resources. So these are some of the challenges. Um, um, oh, I think I changed these. Uh, all right. So I, I th yeah. Okay, so my conclusion actually was that um, what I wanted to say in conclusion is that I hope this definitely leave no one behind. I think we touched upon it in our introduction as well. Um, we need to realize that um, refugees are a very unique set of people and they are very vulnerable and um, they are especially at risk for a COVID outbreak. Um, having said that, um, we've, I've highlighted the situation in Moria to all of you, and this is a refugee camp in Europe. If you think about the fact that about 80% of refugees at the moment actually find themselves in low and middle income countries, um, and that these low and middle income countries have even fewer resources, in health infrastructure, um, staffing to deal with a COVID outbreak, then um, the fourth wave of COVID, which is expected after you know the initial China wave, Europe and US, which is expected to hit um, the low and middle income countries in Africa, for instance, is something which is very worrying, I find, and which um, um, goes to show that a lot of global support is needed. And now more than ever, I feel that no one should be left behind. Um, with this, I would like to wish everyone a very good evening. And thank you again for joining us. Yeah, thank you, Jason. Thank you, everybody.